Chapter 1. Born in Stormy Waters On January 30, 1933, Adolf Hitler was appointed Reichskanzler, High Chancellor, bringing the Nazi Party to power in Germany. On July 20th of that same year, I celebrated my 12th birthday on a date which would be of importance 11 years later. Today, I sometimes wonder if I had already known the name of Adolf Hitler back then. Well, I heard the name for the first time on the radio around that time. But in 1933's Austria, my family and I had other things to worry about. When I was born in Potschach, near Neunkirchen, Lower Austria, on June 20th, 1921, World War I had ended just three years before. My father had served in the Austro-Hungarian Navy at Pola for two years prior to the war. During the war itself, he had been conscripted into working at the Austro-Daimler Works in the town of Wiener Neustadt, being a trained engine fitter and lathe operator. After World War I, during the early 1920s, my father began engaging in local community work. He became a staunch member of the Social Democratic Workers' Party, dedicating all his energy to social welfare in our village. Soon he realised that the concerns of the poorest were only rarely cared about by the politicians of these harsh times. Quite the contrary, many abused their political positions to their personal advantage. Upon realising this, my father became so frustrated that he vacated his office and left the party as a bitter man. Oh, how bad this time was for our family. Misery, hardship and unemployment left the greater part of the people completely hopeless. My father was tirelessly getting and losing jobs, searching constantly for sources of income to feed his family. At the time, weirs were built in the river Schwarzer near our village, and many men, including him, were labouring without a break. Such work, however, was usually based on short-term projects, thus throwing the workers back into unemployment after it was done. Our family was always threatened by the dreaded word Aussteuerung. This meant that any social support that my father would gain during unemployment would be cancelled. Poverty and despondency were omnipresent. Beggars and solicitors went from door to door, trying to get anything for themselves and their families, just to barely avoid starvation. Even though I was a young boy at the time who did not understand what was happening in the adult's world, I was still captured by the spirit of my parents. Never will I forget how my father came home time and again, feeling so ashamed and desperate he did not have the heart to tell my mother that he had lost yet another job. Of course, my mother would register and start crying. They would sit at the table trying to bolster each other up, and me, the little nipper, would play around them, knowing that something was wrong, anxious to cheer them up. Never will I forget how my mother would then pick me up full of love, embracing me tightly. I swore to myself that I would do anything to change these conditions when I grew up. I did not want my parents to be sad. I wanted to see them happy and laughing. Ausgesteuerte, those were the ones walking through the streets begging for a charitable gift. No, I did not want to ever end up like that. When I was five, I joined the Potschach branch of the Deutsche Turner Bund, 1919, DTB, German League for Physical Exercise, at the instigation of my father. This German nationalistic association was in fact a harbour for many eventual national socialists. Why my father, being a social democrat himself, put me into this club of all things remains a mystery to me. Perhaps because the association's clubhouse was near our home, and he wanted to start my physical education at a young age. As far as I can remember, there was no sign of ideological indoctrination at the DTB. Everything was completely about sports. What beliefs our demonstrators held we hardly ever noticed, as we were too young and not really interested in this world that the adults lived in. They were persons to be respected unconditionally, making them unapproachable. On one of his jobs, my father had bartered a radio from an unemployed radio engineer. To me, this was an astounding sensation. I was fascinated by this device that heralded news from cities and countries that I could hardly imagine. Of course, I had a rough idea of Germany, so for the first time I noticed how in the early 30s a new development took place in that country. One name got mentioned over and over again, Adolf Hitler. His device of Arbeit und Brot für jeden, work and bread for all, 
seemed reasonable to me, and it seemed to fall on fertile ground with the people of Germany. Both Germany and Austria were mere travesties of their former empires, but many of the populace still had upheld the national pride of old. This was just the itch that Adolf Hitler's propositions seemed to scratch. While other political parties were arguing, he managed to appeal to the people, thus winning them over. And the people did not ponder for long. Every kind of lasting improvement was better than the current life. The dictate of the Treaty of Versailles, sessions of vast territories, occupied areas, and extensive war reparations did their part to cause resentment. In Austria, these topics were discussed as well. Today I know that some leading politicians like Dr. Karl Renner deemed Austria non-viable, viewing an Anschluss with Germany as the only reasonable option and thus propagating it. Nobody believed in this rest of Austria. The right of self-determination that President Wilson had proclaimed in his 14 points seemingly did not apply to the Austrian people. Quite the opposite, it appeared as if the rest of the world wanted to have its share of the prize. Not just non-German-speaking regions, but also areas like South Tyrol were ripped out of Austria. All these circumstances, from unemployment and misery to discontent over the victorious power's conduct, were evocative of an impending catastrophe at that time already. Adolf Hitler capitalised on all this. He found just the right words, and the German people saw him as their saviour from all the nightmarish hardship that had surrounded them. Unemployment rates started to drop, a spirit of optimism set in, and life in general seemed worth living again. The radio heralded it. The world had changed inside Germany. The wind of change was blowing there. I spent a lot of time sitting by the radio, not getting enough of the music and the news. What else was I to do? While us boys were always afoot, the radio told of things far, far away. After I graduated from Potschach Elementary School, I entered the Glognitz Middle School, which I attended until 1935. During this time, fateful developments took place within Austria as well. It was the time of the Austrian Civil War. We young boys had also caught word of clashes between the different parties. All groups had their own armed formations at the time. Above all, the Heimwehr, Home Guard, and the Republikanische Schutzbund, Republican Protection League, tried to best each other during their marches. Eventually, it came to the events of February 1934. We only heard of the violent clashes in Vienna over the radio, but a short time later I would have to face their consequences directly. In the summer of 1934, my parents and my aunt had agreed on me staying with her in Vienna for a few days, so I took a train to the Vienna Western Railroad station, where my aunt was already waiting. She was keeping house for a Jewish family, and I lived with them. The family was very nice to me, the country-bred boy, and I could not complain about not getting enough to eat. My aunt showed me around the city, and we spent most of the time visiting every corner of Vienna. When this Jewish family eventually emigrated in 1937, perhaps acknowledging the signs of the times, my aunt followed them to England in 1939. In Vienna, I was confronted by the consequences of the February 1934 events. I saw ruined houses and house fronts peppered with bullet holes. For the 13-year-old boy that I was, this was, of course, a big deal, and I reverently walked past the destroyed buildings, not really understanding what had happened here. In Vienna, too, the spirit of the times was almost tangible. People were crestfallen and cheerless. Hardly anyone was laughing. I saw beggars and men wearing signs asking for work. Time and again, people would talk about Germany like it was a faraway land where everything was better. Great desperation here, great hope there. After I was able to graduate middle school with honours in the summer of 1935, my class teacher, Mr. Krausch, talked to my parents and recommended that I receive some higher technical education, having recognised my enthusiasm and talent in that field. However, my father had lost his job at the Semperit Corporation during my final year at school, making him unemployed again. So I also had to bring home some money. You had to pay tuition fees back then, and even though these fees were reduced for low-income households, it had to be paid regularly. My father called on the municipality to get me a spot, but he was met with rejection. 
Thus I had no other choice but to stay at home for a year and try to earn some coin with the occasional job. In September of 1937, I was finally able to move to engineering school. For two years I had worked hard to reach that goal, and I had succeeded on my own. By now there was also enough money to pay the reduced tuition fees for myself. I was granted a second chance to get closer to my dream job, and I was determined to not waste that opportunity. When the German Wehrmacht marched into Austria less than a year later, in March 1938, and our country was renamed Ostmark, I was 16 years old, a student at the Upper High School for Mechanical Engineering in Wancha Neustadt, and deeply convinced that soon I would work as an engineer for the benefit of all people. I wanted to build and develop machines that would make life easier, sparing people from hard labour. Well, for the time being, things were to go differently. Chapter 2. Hitler Arrives The German military occupation was a surprise to nobody. Quite the opposite. It seemed that the Austrian people breathed a sigh of relief. All of Adolf Hitler's successes in Germany were met with almost unexceptional reverence in Austria. And since their attempt at seizing power via a coup d'etat in the 1930s, the National Socialists managed to prevail in Austria despite being prosecuted by the government, even increasing their sympathy among the populace. After crossing the border, German troops were welcomed with enthusiasm, the Austrian army stayed in its barracks, and there was no sign of armed resistance. Suddenly, swastika flags were everywhere, and the Nazis that hitherto had worked in the underground immediately rallied. It was unbelievable how so many people suddenly and keenly supported a political party that had been illegal the day before. And where did all these flags and armbands come from? It was as if some resourceful tailors had sewn them months before to be ready for this day. Everything from swastika flags to the tiniest stick pin, everything was already there. On the eve of March 12, 1938, the National Socialists already held a big torchlight procession. Everyone was up and out. The Nazis, who had no uniforms yet and thus were recognisable only by their white knee socks, were busy organising. Orders were issued, marching groups formed, people lined up. The village was full of swastika flags. It seemed to us that everyone was carried along. Nobody stood up and said, Stop it! No, quite the opposite. Some tried to best each other with their praise for our new Führer, Adolf Hitler. After all, he was one of us, an Austrian, just like us. Austria, however, had now become a part of history, because now we were citizens of the German Reich. The Führer had brought us home into the Reich, and we, the youth, me and my friends. The radio had heralded these developments, of course, and I too was convinced that times would get better now. All the success in Germany, the newfound pride, the feeling of community, those were affirmative terms to me. Thus we liked our new rulers. Not enough to have joined one of those illegal organisations before, but still enough to gaze in amazement at the procession and be convinced that I was now part of a big development. As I said, there was nobody to make us hold on and think. Those who looked pondering, who maybe had a sense of foreboding, were all too few. A storm of enthusiasm had completely occupied our minds. To ask today how this could have happened, how one could be so blind, is simply overbearing. The events had sucked us in, we were fascinated and carried away by them. That is just how it was. Too compelling was the prospect of a better life. Soon we were marching along, screaming, Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. One people, one Reich, one Führer singing marching songs and going into raptures over the prevalent atmosphere. Then, on March 15, 1938, just days after German troops had crossed the border, the word was that the Führer is coming to Vienna. In trucks we were taken to the city. No idea where they had come from, but they were there. We jumped in and off we went. After arriving in Vienna, I saw the largest crowd of people I had ever seen in my life. Everyone was drawn to Hotel Imperial. There, the crowd was waiting in anticipation. Then, on a balcony, the Führer Adolf Hitler emerged. I could see him clearly. The throng broke out in cries of Sieg Heil, and everyone put their right arm up. Amazed by the scene, I thought to myself, 
This is unreal. A few weeks before, the Nazis had been persecuted, and now, all around me, old or young, everyone was cheering the man up there as if it had always been this way. At the Heldenplatz, Heroes Square, Hitler gave a speech from the balcony of the Hofburg before a cheering crowd. Then the Führer rode along the Ringstrasse Boulevard in a large silver limousine, while airplane formations zoomed over our heads. All of this was accompanied by a never-ending frenetic applause of the billowing masses, and I, at seventeen years, was in the middle of this tumult. In the evening we went home exhausted and stirred up. I felt that I had been part of something special. Today I sometimes wonder if I must have realised something, or if I maybe had overlooked anything. Nothing comes to my mind. In Vienna, at least, when I saw those heated masses of people shouting ecstatically towards this man that neither I nor all others actually knew, it seemed clear to me. This is all right. This is just. The world of the adults, an unquestionable entity back in the day, was approving of the change, so we the youth did as well. Moreover, our lack of life experience made us embrace this extraordinary spirit even more than them. When I watch interviews of contemporary witnesses stressing that they had already known it back then, I have to confess that I had not. No, quite the opposite. My environment, my family and I were all convinced to be standing at the beginning of a new golden era. Suddenly everyone was doing better and we should have immediately gone into opposition. Not in the slightest did I question the regime. These lines shall record the truth and will not serve as an excuse for my deeds. But if I were to write anything different here today, it would be a lie. It would simply not confer the truth, but rather conform to the convictions of today. The new rulers became a part of everyday life at an unbelievable pace. Immediately the National Socialistische Partei, abbreviated NSDAP, took over. Everything and everyone was focused on the Führer and his will. Quick progress was made, and I joined the Hitler Jugend, Hitler Youth, becoming a Hitler Junger, Hitler boy. My father was given back his job at the Semperit Corporation in short order. Even he, being an old-school social democrat, seemed relieved to sense a clear direction and a common goal for everyone. Joining the Hitler Jugend, or HJ, was not much of a hassle. Our symbols of recognition were a uniform consisting of a brown shirt, short black trousers, as well as belt, scarf, and an armband with a swastika on it. Soon I acquired a taste for this new feeling of companionship. We spent evenings camping, engaged in varied sports, marching a lot, and playing scouting games. All that felt like a great adventure and made you proud to be part of it. In the summer of 1939, a large H.J. camp was held in Siebenstein, south of Wancher Neustadt. Different H.J. formations from our region and also farther away attended. Sports and camp life came first, but we also received some pre-military training. We were drilled, shot with small bore rifles, marched with a compass, and played scouting games where groups tried to capture each other's flags. So we got a foretaste of the soldier's life we were predetermined to live. In the nearby city of Wuncher Neustadt, the huge works and hangars of the Wiener Neustädter Flugzeugwerke, aircraft works, were erected seemingly overnight. The old locomotive factory was put into operation again, and the airfield was crammed full of German Luftwaffe airplanes that always impressed us when zooming above our heads. Simply put, everything was in motion. In short order, Wuncher Neustadt, the city where I was going to school, had transformed from a desolate town into one teeming with activity, and we all went with the flow. In the summer of 1939, I took up a holiday job at the Semperit Corporation. I was still there in the first days of September during the outbreak of World War II. On September 1st, the entire company staff was assembled in the park on the premises, where some loudspeakers had been installed. The Führer was to give a speech, which we were awaiting tensely. And there it was, his unmistakable voice, heralding that the persecution and bullying of Germans in Poland would no longer be tolerated, that violence would be met with violence. The Polish border had been crossed by German formations at 0545. We were now at war with the Polish state and people. It was, so he said, time to strike back. 
War, at the time something which I barely had any concept of. Back then there had been no First World War, just the World War. Sometimes the men would tell of it, oftentimes stating that we, the Austrians and Germans, had not actually lost but fallen victim to a great treason. But what war itself meant that our fathers said nothing of, the whole deal seemed like honest business in my mind, naturally gentlemanly, honourable and far away from mauled bodies, dead civilians and all the other horrors. Some had been killed, but their names were inscribed on a warrior memorial in the middle of town, which dignified the topic enough in my view to make us not forget the dead. So now we were at war with Poland. It all seemed not that bad, actually, since the radio spoke of victory after victory of the advancing Wehrmacht. Declarations of war by other states such as Great Britain and France remained unnoticed at first. Later they were acknowledged reluctantly with a spirit of we will show you all. Now is the time for revenge. Our weekly highlight was visiting the Voschenschau, newsreel. Uplifting music sounded. Soldiers marched with a winning smirk towards an unseen enemy. Panzers menacingly broke out of the bushes and dive bombers, called Stuka, plunged down with a deafening howl. In our minds, we H.J. boys were, of course, already there, seeing ourselves shouting orders as a tank commander or with both hands on the control stick of a Messerschmitt fighter plane. After the viewing, we excitedly discussed what we had seen, talked about different vehicles, knowing everything about types and armaments, and having nothing but contempt, ridicule, or sometimes pity for our enemies. We did not know them after all. I had never met a Pole, known no French, and imagined every Englishman to be a pretentious lord, Anxious to miss anything, we absorbed everything associated with the war and our German Wehrmacht. Soon I had proven my skills as a leader, and so in spring 1940 I was sent to High Gebietsführerschule, local leader academy, in Weidhofen and der Ebs. There I was delighted to meet more of my kind. We were dedicated to our tasks. Physical education was of utmost importance. Every morning we were mustered at the flag before doing a cross-country run. On top of that, there were additional exercises during the day. Eventually we all qualified for the HJ Sports Badge, which was quite an achievement. You had to perform really well to earn it. And of course there were all sorts of competitions. Winning these was deemed essential, driving our ambitions and making us give our best. In the time between, we were drilled or attended theoretical lectures all in preparation for our duty as leaders. I never closely examined the purpose of these lessons. All that counted was that I earned trust, that my accomplishments were acknowledged, and that I was expected to pass on my knowledge to younger comrades. To younger comrades, not children. Hard as Krupp steel, tough as leather, and swift as greyhounds, was how our Führer wanted his Hitler youth, and we were not wont to disappoint. Our Führer, not the Führer, that was how we called Adolf Hitler. So-called worldview lessons made sure things stayed that way and that we were convinced of our doing, even of the German folk as a whole, more and more. In the summer of 1940, after the Wehrmacht had steamrolled France, an enemy hitherto thought all too superior, in just six incredible weeks I graduated from engineering school with flying colours. During the summer ahead of the final year, I had done a special kind of holiday work together with three fellow students at the Borsig Corporation, located in Berlin-Tegel, so in the Old Reich. The point was to get an impression of the capability of the German industry. Leaving my Ostmark home for the first time and going to Germany was truly exciting. We all took the same train to Berlin and were met with kindness at every moment. It appeared to me that we from the Ostmark were especially welcome even though I sometimes was under the impression that we were travelling from the back country to the big city. At least a few Reich Germans gave me that feeling when they talked big about Berlin. At the corporation we quickly made new friends, casting all reservations between Germans and Ostmarkians aside. Naturally our new friends were keen to show us around. Equally naturally, us new Germans being struck with amazement filled them with pride. Of course, the Berliners enjoyed being seen as the privileged citizens of a new greater German capital city. 
These weeks went by in a flash, and it was time to go home. We asked our supervisor if the way home could be arranged in a more lavish fashion, that is to say we wanted to take a detour to several large cities along the way. Not only was that request granted immediately, everything was paid for as well. So we travelled by train via Munich, Königssee, Salzburg, the Tauern Mountains and Bad Gastein to Klagenfurt in southern Austria and finally across the Semmering Pass back to our home region. I will never forget this journey in which so many impressions were left on me in such a short time. I saw the Alps for the first time and got to know various regions and their people, always just for a short time, but long enough to keep everlasting memories. Back at home, we were understandably met with a lot of curiosity, having to tell at great length about our discovery of Berlin and the long voyage home. Our empurpled tales added to the enjoyment of our listeners. The year 1940 came and passed, winter began, and by the start of 1941 the time had come. After I had finished my education as a mechanical engineer, I received my draft notice. In July of 1940 I had celebrated my 19th birthday. Many of my friends who had not attended a higher school or had already earned their diploma were now deployed to the front. To be honest, I felt a bit guilty about still staying at home at 19 years. The Wehrmacht was rushing from victory to victory, and I was still sitting at home. My brother, on the other hand, being eight years older than me, had participated in the invasion of Poland. With excitement he had told me about the campaign of our troops, and never did he seem to be pondering or gloomy about it. Now was apparently the time to prove my worth, at least in my opinion since my parents were not too delighted of the draft notice I was shoving in their faces. They would rather have seen their second son become an engineer, essential to the war effort. My views were different. Even more so, my draft papers enlisted me for the artillery unit stationed in Siegen, Westfalen. Artillery? That was too far in the back for my taste. Without hesitation, I went to the district military headquarters in Wiener Neustadt and expressed my concerns. My willingness was delightfully noted, and I was allocated to a Panzerjäger Abteilung, anti-tank detachment, in Ludwigshafen at the River Rhine, near Mannheim. At the mustering I had already stated fervently that I wanted to become a reserve officer. If I were to serve the fatherland, I would do so from the front and as an officer. And I was not the only one. My best friend, Fritz Dürker, had the same conviction, and I mentioned him during the visit, Gleefully I told him that our requests had been acknowledged, we even drank a glass of schnapps to the occasion. And my parents? In the days that followed, I caught my mother looking at me for longer than usual, with a lot of love but also sadness in her eyes. Oh well, it won't be too bad, I thought to myself. None of the young men from the neighbourhood had been killed in action yet, and the few local strangers that had were then even buried at the local cemetery so their remains had been brought home. Chapter 3. Making of a Tank Hunter On February 16, 1941, we both reported to Panzerjäger Ersatzabteilung 33, 33rd Reserve Anti-Tank Battalion in Ludwigshafen am Rhein. The distance of 800 km 500 mm miss from home did not bother me. From friends that had been drafted earlier, I knew that there was hardly any free time during basic training, so what better use of that little time than to explore an entirely new town? When Fritz and I had first mentioned our draft notices, there was a big fuss. Our friends congratulated us, patting our backs. We were both filled with pride, and of course envisioned ourselves strolling through town as handsome lieutenants in magnificent uniforms, admired by everyone around. The only drop of bitterness among this euphoric mood was the fact that I had met a girl I liked. Helena was her name, just as in the Greek myth, and so beautiful was she that not even Ulysses would have been able to resist her. I actually had known her for some time, but only shortly before had she lit the fire of a young love in my heart. Duty called, however, and it was time to tell her goodbye. We promised to write to each other to lighten the longing. With the thought of my Helena and best wishes from caring parents in my heart, I began the journey northwards to do my part in achieving the Endsieg, final victory, of the German Wehrmacht. 
Our arrival at our new home was disillusioning. Panzerjäger Ersatzabteilung 33 was stationed at Ludwigshafen near Mannheim am Rhein and also used the training grounds of the nearby Schwetzingen Panzer Barracks, roughly 15 kilometers Sanitsvi Mimi, to the southeast of Mannheim. Apparently the barracks personnel were just waiting for reserve officer trainees like us. Now I was completely in the hands of the German army. Being used to leading Hitler Jungen, it was now my turn to follow orders. First on the agenda was infantry training, which meant field exercises in the surrounding area, wearing either our dress or field uniforms. The dress uniforms served as training garments in order to spare our field uniforms. After at first being bewildered by this practice, we soon realised the point of it. Time and again we had to clean our dress uniforms right after an exhausting field exercise. The soil at the Ludwigshafen training grounds was red like brick dust and never did it take long to cover us in dust or loam depending on the weather. Our instructors seemingly wanted to make sure we were covered in red soil from head to toe. Fresh dirt adorns the soldier, they remarked. I have to say that this part of training did not feel like harassment as I was convinced that I would have to implement these skills one day. But it was not easy. The importance of infantry training was stressed extensively and we literally felt it in our bones. And of course, we were treated just like the reserve officer trainees that we were. Our main caregivers were NCOs and sergeants, while we rarely met any officers. There were, however, exceptional men who cared for their boys. These, of course, left lasting impressions. Among the NCOs, there were all different types of characters. Most of those who had been to the front were treating us much more humanely than those who were in the rear with the gear, who wanted to distinguish themselves with their dashing performance as drill instructors. Aside from field exercises, we marched or fired our Carabiner 98K, the Wehrmacht's service rifle at the time. Usually we marched the long way to the shooting range and then marched back to the barracks late in the evening. Marches up to or even over 40 kilometres, 25 mi, in full gear were not a rarity. These were extremely demanding for many, and several men just collapsed from exhaustion. And after finally arriving at the barracks all dirty, sweaty and at the end of our tethers, we were not allowed off duty. No, it was time to clean our equipment. The instructors would then check our gear and oftentimes impose more thorough cleaning work or extra duty on us. If you had blisters on your feet, you had to tend to them after duty by yourself. Only the worst cases were treated at the sick bay in order to prevent sepsis. The staff there was not eager to admit patients. Seeing the point in these measures was more difficult, especially so right before the weekend. Under alleged objections to our performance, our duty could be prolonged until only a fraction of our free time was left. One particularly popular game was the fancy dress ball, where we were mustered multiple times in short succession, each time wearing different gear. This would often occur on Saturdays, with up to 15 different dresses within an hour before lunch, followed by some drill and an air alert, and then we were busy cleaning everything once again. The only calm time was during lunch, which we had to attend in a perfectly neat uniform, of course. All this ate away at our nerves, only our sense of comradeship helped us cope. In these barracks, living together on limited space, sharing the same hardships, challenges and strains, we formed a strong bond. Basic training offered some pleasant surprises as well. During our runner exercises, we had to draw maps of the surrounding terrain and navigate the area using a compass. Eventually, we had to find a lonely homestead where our instructors awaited us with a glass of schnapps that we surely did not expect. When it came to individual training, we were encouraged to show top performance through all sorts of competitions, and we all were up to the challenge. Our swearing-in ceremony was especially imposing. The whole event was meant to leave a lasting impression with us young recruits, successfully, I might add. At the top of our voice, we spoke the oath. Ich schwöre bei Gott diesen heiligen Eid, dass ich dem Führer des Deutschen Reiches und Volkes, Adolf Hitler, dem Oberbefehlshaber der Wehrmacht, unbedingten Gehorsam leisten und als tapferer Soldat bereit sein will, jederzeit für diesen Eid mein Leben einzusetzen. 
I swear by God this sacred oath to the Führer of the German Reich and people, Adolf Hitler, Supreme Commander of the Wehrmacht, I will serve with unquestioning obedience, and, as a valiant soldier, I will be ready to honour this oath with my own life. What astounded me was that there was no mention of a fatherland or homeland. We were sworn in on the Führer, Adolf Hitler himself. Well, we did not waste a second thought on that. Happy to complete our basic training, us reserve officer trainees were looking forward to the future. After the tough and demanding weeks of basic training, we were subject to specialist weapons training. For us, this meant getting to know the 3.7 cm Panzerabwehr Kanone 35-36, 3.7 cm Pak 36 anti-tank gun. At the start of the war, this gun had been the Wehrmacht's primary means of combating tanks. By now, it had mostly been phased out of frontline duty. During the French campaign of 1940, its calibre proved too small to penetrate the thicker armour of French Char and British Matilda tanks. Soon, larger calibre guns like the 50 Militon Pac 38 or the 75 Militon Pac 40 were deployed. Since the Pac 35 36 was similar to the Pac 38, the former continued to be in service, mostly for training purposes. Over the course of the war, the gun earned the nickname Panzer and Klopfgerät, lit tank knocking device. That name spoke for itself. Only a new type of ammunition, the steel Holler Dungsgranate, a shaped charged shell, helped a bit after its introduction in 1942. It could penetrate up to 180 Milatauts, 612 in, of steel armour, but its range was rather low, so you had to let an enemy tank close in to around 200 Wildsids. Not the best option during a firefight, the Pak 3536 was a drawn gun, consisting essentially of a barrel and breech, a sloped gun shield of 5 metre C 0.2 in thickness, a split trail with two round beams and two wheels. Two soldiers were enough to successfully operate the gun. We soon realised the true meaning of drawn during the weeks that followed, not only getting to know all the weapons ins and outs, but putting the gun into position manually countless times. Always pressed for time, of course, since enemy tank ahead was a recurring theme. With its combat weight of 330 kios, 725 lab C or, the gun was still light enough for us to complete all these tasks in a timely fashion. In secret, however, we were happy not to serve in the heavy artillery. After the first shots with live ammunition, we also lost all interest in serving with the panzer troops. We witnessed the effect that even a small 3.7 scimitar projectile could have on a practice target. The shell's tungsten core had bored right through the steel target, and the effect on anything behind it was ominous to us. Driving a tank into the concentrated fire of a whole anti-tank platoon seemed like suicide. Surviving inside a tank always depended on the thickness of its armour, as well as individual luck. Time and again we realised that there was no single spot on the battlefield that offered better chances of surviving the fight than any other. Whether on land, at sea or in the air, death had all kinds of faces and your odds were equally good or bad everywhere. The solution offered to us was strict drills and demanding a lot from yourself, which was presented as life prolonging. We exercised each and every step until it became second nature. Eventually we were dreaming of them, and of course we were brushed up on our infantry training from time to time. A gun crew consisted of four men, who all were soon committed to each other and ready to take on all that may come, or so we thought. After training with the gun, some of us were chosen for additional driving lessons. I was one of the lucky few and earned a license for motorcycles, passenger cars, as well as trucks. By late April 1941, Still during our gun training with the Pak 3536, we were subject to strict examinations testing our tropical fitness. This gave us an idea of where our first deployment to the front would be. Those who passed would have their trial by fire in Africa. And we wanted it. In fact, our Panzerjäger Satzabteilung 33 formed the reserve for Panzerjäger Abteilung 33, PCJ Gap 33, 33rd Anti-Tank Battalion. 
which meant that any losses suffered by Panzerjäger Abteilung 33 were compensated by new recruits from our ersatz unit at home. After completing their training, the ersatz was immediately sent to the front. In April 1941, Panzerjäger Abteilung 33 was assigned to the 15 Panzer Division, originally formed in November 1940 from parts of the 33. Infantry Division, it was shifted to Africa starting April 1941. The first German troops there, commanded by Major General Erwin Rommel, had appeared on February 11, 1941, just days before the beginning of my service. German newsreels had made a big fuss, and there were rumours about how Rommel had ordered his troops to drive multiple rounds through Tripoli in a big parade in order to make local British spies believe that a much larger force was present. We young soldiers could not know if there was any truth to that rumour, but nevertheless the story was impressive. Starting in early April 1941, the 15 Panzer Division was shipped from Italian Naples across the Mediterranean Sea to Libya. Once there, it was to be deployed at Tobruk, a coastal town staunchly defended by the British and relentlessly attacked by the Germans. Brigadier General Heinrich von Prittwitz und Gaffron, then commander of the 15 Panzer Division, had been killed on April 10th during forward reconnaissance by a direct hit from an Australian anti-tank gun. So, men from a unit like mine, but on the other side, had killed my division's commanding officer even before the unit had arrived in the theatre of war. After us young recruits had figured out which unit's ersatz we were in February 1941, we always watched those parts of the German newsreels concerning developments in Africa with increased interest. After passing the examinations on tropical fitness, we knew full well, we're going to Africa. Chapter 4 Africa Corps. After completing my three-month training, my comrades, including, to my great joy, my friend Fritz, and I were housed in private quarters at Enkenbach, near Kaiserslautern, Germany. Those were pleasurable circumstances for us, since we were able to escape the daily grind inside the barracks into a civil environment. We were not idle, however, receiving tropical uniforms and a lot of other equipment. The officers, as well as the Spies, meaning the highest-ranking NCO of the company, began making dispositions and organising the preparations for a redeployment to Africa. Getting new uniforms and gear made us sporty, and we had our own little fancy balls. In addition, there were lots of lessons aimed at preparing us for the environmental conditions of the continent, as well as African people and their customs. We learned about scorpions and sandstorms, about Bedouins, and about how much water the human body needs to survive. There were also small booklets handed to us for further reading, containing everything about the lands and peoples of North Africa. And of course, we kept moving out to refresh or improve our infantry skills in the field. In May and July 1941, Rommel's lucky star had risen over Africa. My parent unit, Panzerjägerabteilung 33, had been involved in the fighting and suffered its first losses. At that time, the detachment was composed of a headquarters company for logistics, a signal platoon for communications, and three Panzerabwehr Kompanien, one to three Pizar BWKP. Each of these anti-tank companies consisted of three platoons, each fielding four 37 mm pack 3536. Due to casualties of dead and wounded during the fighting around Solom and Halfaya Pass in June, it was high time to ferry in replacements from Germany. So, leaving our private quarters in late June, our whole detachment was put on trains and sent across the Alps and through all of Italy to Tarrant. When we arrived there, the surprise was great. In front of us in the harbour were three huge cruise ships. Full of astonishment, we learned the names of the three giants, Oceania, Neptunia and Marco Polo. The ships Oceania and Neptunia were two sister ships grossing around 20,000 GRT each. It was agreed with the Italians that each crossing was to consist of half German and half Italian troops and supplies each. The ships were actually passenger ships which had been converted to troop ships. For this purpose they had been equipped with 105mm guns for submarine defence at the bow and stern and 20mm twin flak guns against air attack distributed over the whole ship. With mixed feelings we went on board. 
On deck, while we already received life jackets, rumours quickly spread, and we learned that the Mediterranean was teeming with British submarines. Just in April, a complete convoy consisting of five freighters was destroyed by those. Altogether, more than 1,500 soldiers and sailors had drowned. This didn't necessarily comfort us. Once on board, we witnessed the ships being loaded. Thousands of soldiers like us were streaming on board, and heavy cranes lifted all sorts of goods packed in large crates, but also vehicles and guns on board to disappear in the ship's bellies. There was an incredible amount of activity, and with interest we observed the Italian dock workers, who carried out the loading with a lot of gesticulation, but skillfully. At the onset of the evening we got to our bunks, lying as tight as sardines in a can. After one night inside the cramped ship, we departed on the next day. On deck, leaning against the railing, we watched the spectacle unfold. Ahead of us, our escort, consisting of some sleek Italian destroyers, began to move, and our converted cruise ships followed lumberingly. One lonely German Ju-88 warplane appeared in the sky to spot surfacing submarines in time to warn our Italian companions. The ship started going on a zigzag course for increased safety. After some time, we went on to befriend the Italian anti-aircraft gun crews. They immediately proved to be very approachable. To overcome the language barrier, we tried communicating with hands and feet, as the German saying goes. They let us man the guns, and soon we eagerly performed targeting practice. Patting each other's backs, we managed to ease the tension. We found our Italian allies to be quite nice fellows who told us about their homeland with a lot of emotion in their voice. The tension during departure, as well as our training on those AA guns, was soon replaced by the monotony of travel over the sea. However, and after a chilly breeze had set in, we eventually decided to go below deck, where we also spent the night. The next day, nothing but the same thing, with nothing happening. Finally, we reached Tripoli Harbour, Libya, after two days at sea without special incidents. Upon arrival in Tripoli, we were immediately charmed by the Mediterranean coastal city. Flat-roofed houses with tall minarets in between dominated the townscape. The shore was flat and the streets framed by palm trees. In the harbour, there was a frenzy of activity in expectation of our ship's arrival. Something that also welcomed us immediately, however, was incredible heat. Having not felt its full force at sea thanks to a cool salt breeze, the sun was beating down on us relentlessly as soon as we slowed down to enter the harbour. We began sweating inside our uniforms, and the sweat ran into our eyes below our uniform caps. Immediately the unloading commenced. We went ashore and assembled in front of the harbour office building, where trucks were already standing ready for us. There I saw the distinctive symbol of the German Africa Corps for the first time, a palm tree with the trunk halved by the swastika. Both were simply painted onto the former field grey doors, with the whole truck around them being hastily covered in sand-coloured paint. Disembarking from the ship and carrying our gear was already enough to cover us in sweat. We quickly realised that any unnecessary movement was to be avoided. But to no avail, the tail lifts were dropped. We started loading and eventually mounted the trucks. The ride commenced and instantly we discovered another inconvenience even worse than the heat, dust. It got to us on the load bed from the sides as well as from behind, and everyone rummaged around for a handkerchief to hastily tie around mouth and nose. Our ride led through Tripoli and along a straight asphalt road eastward. Upon leaving the harbour we saw the first locals populating the streets in their customary attire. We also noticed veiled women for the first time. Donkeys and a few camels strolled by on the street and were enveloped by our cloud of dust. After some time, we reached Cumham 5. Kilometre 5 was the name of the reception and acclimatisation camp established in the desert. Being located in the desert roughly five kilometres, three miles, east of Tripoli, it was named that way for a lack of any nearby prominent terrain feature. This camp was now to be our home for the first days in Africa. Here I also received the news that from now on I was assigned to the headquarters company of Panzerjägerabteilung 33 as a driver and messenger. Our first mission as newbies was to get accustomed to the climate of the theatre of operations, 
as well as familiarize with the carpool. The first days went by smoothly. We established contact with other German soldiers who had been here for longer and tried drawing from their experience and, most of all, to hear the latest news from the front lines. Solom and Halfaya Pass had been defended successfully and the latest reports indicated the British being on the retreat. I immediately noticed how faithfully the soldiers were talking about Rommel. His vigorous decision-making after he first arrived in Africa had found much appreciation among the lower ranks and the victories achieved had convinced them of his skill as a leader. The entire Africa Corps was in high spirits after it managed to beat the British and sent it into the desert. Our units had developed into a powerful force with great morale. Rommel and his officers were leading from the front, a fact thanks to which many important decisions could be made without delay. As a sign of affiliation, the Africa Corps' armband was introduced for all men of the German Africa Corps, a strip of fabric with the word Afrika Corps stitched in silver on a green background, which every soldier was wearing on his lower left sleeve. This, of course, contributed to a sense of unity among the men, and everyone, including me, proudly wore that stripe on his uniform. Any Italians we encountered were also regaining some visible confidence. Here, the difference between officers, non-commissioned officers, NCOs, and enlisted men was greater, especially when it came to morale and fighting spirit. While our officers, NCOs, and enlisted men all shared the same rations, the Italian army handled this very differently. They had four different kinds of menus, strictly divided into officer, sergeant, NCO, and enlisted men rations. Officers were served three-course meals, while the lowest ranks often suffered from starvation. We were surprised to find that the humble soldier was not considered to be of much worth in the Italian army. This helped us better understand the reports of lacking combat prowess of our southern allies. There were exceptions to be pointed out as well, however, and time and again we heard stories of Italian soldiers showing great courage during the bitter fighting in June. The different alignments among the Italians were also interesting to me. There were followers of Mussolini as well as the Italian king. Men aligned with Il Duce were fighting more doggedly, while men true to the king somewhat lacked enthusiasm in the field. All of them admired us Germans, however, and I had heard that when the Italians were fighting directly at our side, their fighting spirit improved considerably. Back in the military camp, the daily challenges of the desert climate embraced us again. Soon we got to know several annoying fellows, sand fleas, scorpions as well as sand vipers and adders. The camp's close surroundings featured expansive cactus fields, which were home to all kinds of critters. Sand fleas and scorpions proved to be the most annoying. The camp was made up of barracks and tents erected right on the desert soil. Consequently, we had to welcome various guests on the floor every morning. Every day, soldiers were stung by scorpions and had to be treated at the medic's tent. So we quickly developed a habit of tying our shoes shafts closed after doffing them in the evening or shaking them out in the morning. This applied to all things and items in general which were left unattended for a short while. All kinds of wildlife could have crawled inside. In addition, the sun was of course very discomforting. If we were to deploy to the front lines right after arriving, we probably would have collapsed after a short while. Acclimatization was of utmost necessity and importance. We realized that in the midday sun every kind of movement was excruciating and that the interior of any vehicle became as hot as an oven. Water was to be consumed at any opportunity in order to avoid dehydration. Here in the rear echelon, behind the front line, there was still enough of it. Providing some form of shade, be it by putting up tarpaulins or camo netting, was paramount and our highest priority during every rest and at the beginning of every short stop. Our desert equipment unfortunately proved to be of limited adequacy to these conditions. The uniforms had been designed based on experiences in German colonies during World War I. However, they were mostly unfit for use in the Libyan desert. Unlike British uniforms, which were made from wool, ours were made from cotton. This meant that they were cold at night, gave warmth during the day, and absorbed humidity in the morning. 
Only our high boots proved highly useful against sharp thorns and spikes of dry desert vegetation. The tropical helmet, which had seemed very handsome back in Germany, soon turned out unsuitable. The combination caps that were handed out were much more practical. Once in combat, you would wear your steel helmet to fend off shrapnel. As time went on, everyone collected his own custom inventory of varying uniform parts, ranging from British shorts to Wehrmacht coats and Italian uniform jackets. Our superiors, who had to endure the exact same hardships, graciously turned a blind eye to their men becoming more and more colourful. At first, however, we had to make do with the uniforms we had brought with us from Germany. We soon commenced trading a wide variety of uniform parts with Italian soldiers. To have more water available, an additional canteen proved very useful too. These aluminum flasks, if you were lucky, were covered in soft felt which could be soaked in order to keep the inside cool through evaporation. Additionally, everyone soon had a good scarf to protect against dust as well as sunglasses to help with bright sunlight. Being in this life-hostile environment made us learn quickly. Chapter 5. Baptism of Fire In July 1941, I made my first long supply trip from Tripoli to Solom. Half-track vehicles, which were mainly used as tractors for our light anti-tank guns, had also come with us. These had proved themselves in the hot climate without any problems. During pauses, the column was spaced out very far to offer no concentrated target, while at night we went in close formation to make the escort's job easier, as well as reducing the chance of someone getting left behind in the desert, which had happened several times before. More than just a few German and Italian soldiers were swallowed up by the desert during the fighting in North Africa, never to be seen again. German and Italian field engineers had constructed a roughly 80-kilometre, 50 missa long road circumventing the siege of Tobruk, so the only thing we noticed while bypassing the scene was the thundering rumble of artillery duels raging around the town. Also of note was the border between Libya and Egypt, which was demarcated by a 50 kilometres, 30 metre long fence of barbed wire starting at the coast, crossing the road and then leading into the desert. After our arrival at Solom and unloading, I was ordered to report to the command post of Panzerjäger Abteilung 33. It consisted of one of the flat buildings typical for the region and a few tents. I reported and was immediately sent directly to one of the officers. He was standing in front of a tent talking to some NCOs. By his shoulder pieces I recognised him as an Oberleutnant, first lieutenant. I stood to attention and reported, Lieutenant, Private Hola reporting as ordered. He looked me over and said, Hola, very good. My name is Lieutenant Maida. I am a staff officer for special deployment. I've been informed you're my new driver. Yes, Lieutenant, I confirmed. Very well. In the fighting of the last weeks, I lost my messenger. From now on, you are assigned to me and thus my new attendant. Report to the Kraftfahrer Fizier, motor pool officer, he will assign you to a motorcycle. Welcome to the front, Hola, he said, and shook my hand. In light of this friendly gesture, I must have looked quite surprised because the non-commissioned officers who had listened to our conversation were all smiling. So this was it. From now on, I was a crowd messenger for the staff of Panzerjägerabteilung 33. The staff essentially enabled the detachment's commander to lead his force. It also had several messengers like me. This assignment meant that I would not return to Tripoli, but rather stay here. Very well, I thought. Now I won't have to endure the long journey back, and also I was eager to get to the front lines. My first impression of First Lieutenant Meda had been of a positive nature, and sergeants as well as NCOs seemed likeable. The motor pool officer gave me a short briefing and noted my data, in case my relatives needed to be informed of my demise. He also showed me my new quarters for the time being, a small tent on the desert floor. The ground had not been prepared much, just a few layers of rocks had been piled up in a circle around the tent. Against the shrapnel, the officer proclaimed. From an NCO, who was responsible for the staff's vehicles, I received my machine, a heavy BMW with a sidecar. I parked it right in front of my tent, fully fueled, to be ready at a moment's notice. 
My car 98 carbine. I swapped for an MP40 submachine gun, which was handier and less of an inconvenience while driving. It was easy to handle, but I was told to maintain it with special care in this dusty desert climate, which meant cleaning it over and over again and oiling it as little as possible. Oil absorbed the dust, causing unwelcome jamming, not the best of things to happen when face to face with the enemy. Close to our camp was one of the three anti-tank companies, its assortment of vehicles and ordnance was not bad at all. The Part 3536 that I knew well formed its main armament, for which there were half-track tractors, Leichter Zugkraftwagen Sonderkraftfahrzeug 10, SDKFZ 10, available. In addition, I spotted a few Opel Blitz trucks, Hoch medium personnel transports, as well as several VW Kubelwagen off-road cars, called Kubel. Over the following days, I familiarised myself with the solemn area, getting to know some other men of the detachment as well. They hailed from all kinds of places, even Ostmerkers like me were among them, which stirred up some home-like feelings. The three anti-tank platoons of the company close to us were deployed at the pass roads near Solom as well as Halfaya Pass, a focus of anti-tank capability between the infantry of I Battalion, Schutzen Regiment 104. 104th Rifle Regiment. These soldiers had captured the pass in May 1941, and in June they had successfully defended it against British tank attacks. The successful defence had been made possible by the use of several 88mm AA gun batteries in the Solemn area. As I found out, those heavy gun batteries belonged to the first detachments of either Flak Regiment 18, AA Regiment 18, as well as Flak Regiment 33. Talking to other soldiers, I learned that Flak Regiment 18 had been deployed for combat in Africa after moving over Sicily from its home garrison in Wiener Neustadt, Ostmark. Their positions were well fortified and their crews were full of confidence owing to their recent success against the British heavy tanks. All in all, the batteries deployed had disabled 91 British tanks. Soon I was ordered to report at the detachment command post, ready to start, First Lieutenant Meader was already waiting for me. Well, Hola, up to the front it is. Today we're going to inspect our detachment's furthermost positions. Just take us where I point to. I already know the way by heart, he said. Off we went, racing away. As he had announced, he pointed in some direction, and we raced through the desert, passing dunes of sand and rocks shaped into bizarre patterns by the wind. Time and again I looked to the edge of my goggles to take a peek at my passenger in the sidecar. Despite the darkness setting in more and more, he seemed perfectly confident that the direction we were heading was correct. Eventually we reached our positions at Halfaya Pass. The sun had already sunk below the horizon, leaving behind a twilight in the sky. The only sign of having reached our destination was the fact that the first lieutenant ordered me to halt. As we were standing there, the engine chugging away idling, and I took a hard look through the dusty gogglies into the dark, I spotted a silhouette departing from the rocks and closing in purposefully. It was our contact. I felt relieved and secretly admired the first lieutenant for his sense of direction. Thanks to months of experience in the North African desert, he had found the way to the forward positions almost blindly. Our front line essentially consisted of drawn-out anti-tank gun, machine gun, and infantry positions nestling to the plateau's edge. A serpentine road led from the coast below up to the plateau. Halfaya Pass was the opening between the two. In the bright moonlight, I had a fantastic view from the edge. One could clearly make out the sea. I reckoned that during the day this elevated area would be unbearably hot. In our positions, I recognised the familiar Park 3536 as well as MG 34 carriages, the dugouts were surrounded by walls of piled-up stones, and only little actual digging had taken place. The rocky ground was simply too hard to get deep. The soldiers' tents were close by, utilising each and every depression in the ground to protect against shrapnel. There was no artificial source of light to be seen, the front-line men blending into the surrounding rocks and dry bushes. Immediately, the first lieutenant began checking on each position. Following him, I seized the opportunity to speak to soldiers from the company. 
They were quite welcoming and asked what was new in nearby Solemn. Well, me as a newcomer had little to talk about, so they told me about the fierce battle they had made it through in June just a few weeks ago. We were on our way to the next position as a sudden thunder tore through the air, followed by a surging rustle. We halted, and I looked at my first lieutenant, who in turn looked at me. With his jaw dropped as if gasping for air, he screamed, Take cover! Arms ahead, I leaped as quickly as possible behind the nearest boulder, and just then the impacts commenced. With loud bangs, the enemy artillery shells detonated amidst our positions. Immediately the area was illuminated as bright as day from all the explosion flashes. There were so many detonations in such a short time that it sounded like a relentlessly coherent, deafening roar. With a bright flash, a shell went down less than 20 metres, 65 F8 ahead, and I could feel the shockwave generated by the blast. There was a loud whirring all around, and I realised that its cause was shrapnel virtually filling the air. I observed red-hot splinters hitting nearby rocks, coming to rest in the sand and smoking. All of this took mere seconds and was over as fast as it had begun. After a moment of absolute silence, painful screaming tore through the night, followed closely by cries for a medic. You could hear the shock in this shrill voice. The screams were coming out of the darkness immediately ahead. From the position that we wanted to visit next, a semblance of curses, we have casualties, flashed through my mind. Since we could not hear any more gunfire, the first lieutenant and I sprang up and ran towards the position ahead. It was a horrific scene which was only bearable thanks to the dark. Medics were already at the site, trying to save what was left to save under a dim flashlight. The medics struggled to rescue the wounded and fallen soldiers. Two maimed bodies lay motionless, while a third was writhing in pain, sobbing convulsively. The smell of burnt powder filled the air, and only a twisted wreck remained in the AT gun position. Two men had been killed instantly, one had been badly wounded by shrapnel. The British shell had hit the 3.7 cm at gun's position directly, as well as its unfortunate crew in the nearby tent. A lucky shot for the Brits, a disaster for the gun crew. The low rock wall had not offered enough protection so that the tent was simply blown away. I was standing at the site, taken aback by the sight. As the first lieutenant was energetically directing the rescue efforts, I tried to help bring the wounded to the back into a safer area. That went quite fast, I thought to myself. One moment we were chatting under a quiet dome of stars, the next we were caught by the reality of war and its utter cruelty. I found myself shaking a bit once the adrenaline started fading. This fire attack had caught me red-handed, while it had also been my trial of fire, although I had had different expectations of the latter. The following weeks went by smoothly. British artillery strikes became somewhat of a routine, and yes, one could actually get used to them. Only rarely did a shell hit one of our positions directly in the way I had witnessed. Most of them detonated at some distance away, which of course was anything but harmless. Each shell created a downpour of shrapnel. Our own artillery answered only rarely, namely once a British position or battery had been clearly identified. We did not have enough ammunition to fire off blindly in the general direction of the enemy. For the most part, the purpose of both sides' artillery fire was to not give the opponent any peace as well as disrupting enemy activity. As always, the military had a term for this. Stur oder Streufeuer, harassing fire or zone fire. In mid-August of 1941, we were redeployed from Upper to Lower Solemn, closer to the coast. Lower Solemn's main feature was its large wadi, a wide dried-out riverbed leading into a large bay on the coast. This area would provide additional protection against the British long-range artillery fire. The wadi also offered more green than the plateau, and with great joy we discovered some fig trees bearing ripe fruits. Fishing at sea was also possible, and we did so with minimal effort. We would simply throw a hand grenade into the water, let it detonate, and then gather the fish killed by the shockwave. Fruits and fish were a welcome improvement of our rations. Food, rations and fresh water were a thing of their own altogether. 
Most of the food consisted of all kinds of canned fodder, very often sardines in oil, which in the heat often agitated one's stomach. Usually we also drank the oil to get some additional hydration. In addition, those canned sardines were a barter good coveted by the Bedouins who gave us pumpkins, dates or other fruit in return. Italian rations were also part of the daily menu, which mostly consisted of AM cans. We sarcastically called them Arma Mussolini, poor Mussolini. Up to this day I have no idea what AM actually stood for. They contained fibrous donkey meat, as well as rock-hard cheese and crisp bread. And, of course, sand, which always found its way into the mouth, grinding between the teeth. In the newsreels they showed how in the searing heat eggs were cooked on the steel plating of our tanks. That may very well have been possible, as it was clearly hot enough, but I cannot say for sure since I never saw a single egg in all of Africa. On that same note I hardly saw any of our tanks in the summer of 1941. So we entertained ourselves by painting white Balkenkreuzer on the back of turtles we found near the sea. I wonder if the British found any of them during their later advance in November, and if so, what they may have thought of their discovery. Water was always in short supply, or what was there was salty. Coffee, for example, was brewed with salt water. It tasted awful, but one got used to it. But the thirst grew more and more, and I caught myself daydreaming about drinking from the cold, clear water of the Saubach stream, springing from the foot of Mount Schneeberg back at home, where we used to catch trout as kids. This happened at night, too. You would reach for your full canteen to take a sip, but it never became real. We later learned a handy trick from the Italians. They put a dash of anise schnapps in their canteens. This made the water taste terrible, but the taste of anise covered up the sensation of thirst for a while. Word of this soon got around, and anise schnapps became hard to get. Water from the wells, which often lay close to the sea, was often salty as well. Many of us paid for this prolonged dehydration in later years with kidney stones. This happened to me too. After a few months, almost everyone was suffering from chronic inflammation of the kidneys and gastroenteritis. Profuse sweating during the daytime left crusts of salt on the uniform. This was exacerbated on the rare occasions when we took a bath in the sea or when we washed our uniforms in the seawater. The salt remained in the uniform's fabric. In the cold nights, a salt-rich uniform drew humidity from the sea breeze, which soon made for a wet uniform you had to wear in the cool night. The consequences were colds as well as inflammations of kidney and bladder. Everyone wore something extra around their belly at night, but colds and diarrhoea were still a common problem. Oftentimes people would carry a spade with them to dig a small hole before relieving themselves. This was quite important, as it prevented infectious germs from getting spread by wind and dust. But sometimes one of the men had such a sudden urge that he did not have any time to dig a hole or even drop his trousers. Getting said trousers clean again without water available was another story. The Bedouins taught us to wash ourselves with sand. People had watery diarrhoea for weeks or even months on end. This was caused not by the aforementioned hypothermia, but mostly by the widespread dysentery. Once you had that, it was hard to get rid of. Your condition deteriorated and the immune system weakened more and more. As if that was not enough, your liver would soon take its toll. By the end of summer, almost everyone at the front suffered from jaundice. You could see it in your comrades' eyes. We attributed our bad health to the rations and permanent inflammations within our lower bodies. I languished so much that I was almost brought to my knees. But there was not much to do about it. Those who fell and would not stand up again were brought to the sick bay, while the rest held their positions in more or less of a good condition. In August 1941, signs were abundant indicating the preparation for our own offensive. Initially, rumours circulated suggesting that Rommel planned to attack at the next opportunity. However, a shortage of supplies had forced him to delay his plans. Despite early victories, he had to accept the necessity of postponing his next attack. Meanwhile, an increasing amount of new material was brought to the front. Among these were the new, stronger, Park 38 anti-tank guns, 
which fired 50mm rounds instead of the old 37mm ones. These shells were developed to ensure success even against thickly armoured fighting vehicles. Weighing a little over 900 kilo, 2,000 lbs, the new guns were somewhat larger than the old Pack 3536. Their range exceeded 9,000 metres, 5.6 miles, offering improved accuracy at medium distances. At over 1,000 metres, 1 for 90 YD, away, their armour-piercing shells could still penetrate almost 50 millilitres, two in, of steel, making them effective against British Matilda and Crusader tanks. Initially, one of our three platoons was equipped with four Pack 38 guns. We immediately commenced training with these guns, noting the significant weight difference of almost 600 kilo, 1300 lbs. The number of men in each gun crew was increased, and training hours were mostly in the evening when lower temperatures made movement more bearable. In combat, every man had to do his part, meaning that even messengers were expected to handle an AT gun if necessary. One mid-August evening, while visiting one of the positions, the alarms suddenly sounded. An observation post had detected suspicious movement. Tensions rose as we gazed into the desert ahead. Gun crews readied shells, and the clacking of Amocrates revealed that MG positions were preparing for an assault. The presence of the first lieutenant had a reassuring effect on Us. After some time, with the sun setting, he decided to send a scouting party toward the detected movement. A short briefing followed, and some men left our forward positions and disappeared into the twilight. Anxiously, we waited as Maida readied his flare gun in case of a firefight. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, the scouting party returned. Darkness had set in, and we feared the worst. However, they brought a big surprise with them. Four captured Englishmen. They had been ordered to recon our positions, and one of them had slipped off a rock, injuring his leg badly. The fall, along with the resulting unusual movement through the motionless desert, was detected by our observation post. The British had planned to wait for darkness to bring their injured comrade back to their own lines, but our scouting party caught them by surprise. They were so occupied with rescuing their comrade that they did not notice our men approaching. Even with the help of our soldiers, it took them a substantial amount of time to reach our lines. The prisoners were brought to a tent and subjected to a first interrogation by Maida. This gave me plenty of time to observe our opponents. To my surprise, they looked just like us. Well, what had I expected? An English lord strolling around the desert with a cane and bowler hat. Even their uniforms were similar to ours, with only their distinctive flat, brody helmets and knee-high stockings setting them apart. They appeared quite exhausted and gratefully accepted the water we offered. The fellow with a broken leg was in great pain. One could see that he was barely able to keep his composure. The medics did their best to make him comfortable, but mostly in vain. After some time, as the interrogation ended and the first lieutenant organised the prisoner's transportation, the radio in a neighbouring tent began to play the well-known song of Lily Marlene. All of us fell silent and the British began humming softly along with the song. Their leader, a sergeant, asked the first lieutenant to wait until the song's end. Maida nodded, and we all raptly listened to the whole song. For the first time, in this frankly incidental and harmless situation, exhausted, tired and face to face with the enemy, I questioned whether the war we were fighting made sense. I was moved by these events and felt an unprecedented connection to the British. Here they were, young fellows, as gaunt and weary as us, but just as full of dreams. In that moment, we were closer to each other than ever before. In fact, that song held a special significance. Sung by Lael Anderson in four verses, Lily Marlene had become famous on both sides of the front. The British had translated it into English using the same melody. Each day, shortly before 10 p.m., it was aired on all German military stations to conclude the day's broadcast. These broadcasts could also be received by the British. Whenever circumstances permitted, each of us tried not to miss that moment. Radios were tuned to the corresponding frequency, and for a few minutes all of us escaped from the war. 
If one were to walk through the camp, the song softly sounded from every tent, every dugout, every tank, and every command vehicle. Oftentimes I would witness someone with tears in their eyes, hastily wiping them away when they felt caught. The song stirred up feelings of longing and touching sentiment in stark contrast to the unbearably dreadful reality all around us. During this time, we never experienced any artillery strikes or any other kind of attack. It was a kind of unofficial ceasefire. While this may seem glorifying to today's reader, in times of war there are countless such incidents, moments of happenstance that, for a short while, unite all parties involved in a common longing for home and family. However, this temporary respite would inevitably give way to the same old hatred and vigour as we resumed slaughtering each other shortly thereafter.